begins with liberty and law, which this amendment so wisely attempts to restore. And I strongly support the amendment and urge its adoption. Gentlemen, yield back his time. The question is. For what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? Strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. The gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I hope all both sides consider the fact of what's happened over the last year or two. The fact is, is that this amendment is here before us because we have an extraordinary situation that has happened in certain uh, local communities and states, where the federal government has actually intervened and filed a lawsuit based on the fact that. The administration felt that local communities being involved in the enforcement of federal immigration law was somehow encroaching on the ability of the federal government to enforce the law. When in fact, if you read their statement against a state like Arizona, the encroachment was not because they were enforcing some new law or some off the wall approach, but the fact that they were enforcing the law. And in fact, in the case of Arizona, it said that Arizona enforcing immigration law infringed on the executive branch ability or prerogative not to enforce the law at any time the executive branch chooses. Now, I think as legislators, Democrats and Republicans, but most importantly as Americans, we need to stand up for the fact the executive branch is here to enforce the law, not to pick. Which laws to enforce and which ones to ignore? We make the laws, Mr. Chairman, not the White House. We make the laws that the White House is supposed to be enforcing. But sadly, we have seen in the last few years the executive branch claiming the right to choose which laws to enforce and which not. And in the Arizona case, they specifically stated. That they choose not to enforce the law, thus Arizona enforcing the federal law is some kind of encroachment on the executive prerogative. That you and I, and Democrats, Republicans, and Americans across the country who believe in separation of powers, should stand up and say, Executive, you do not have the power to legislate from the White House. That's our job. You do not have the authority to pick and choose what laws you enforce. We all remember the, the police officer who says. Sir, I do not make the laws, I just enforce them. All we're asking here is that the executive branch understands they are not here to choose which laws are honorable and appropriate to be enforced. Those are our prerogative to pass those laws and tell the executive branch your job is to enforce it. And definitely it's not the executive's right to use taxpayers' money to sue states for cooperation and implementation of laws that this body. And bodies before us have passed to make the federal law and the enforcement of those federal laws are an essential point, not just the immigration control, but the entire concept that this republic was founded on. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? To strike the last word. The gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I yield my time to my colleague. I thank the gentleman. Let me try to gentleman, sum gentleman this from up. California, gentleman from California has to remain on his feet. Um, let me sum this up because there's a lot of passion. The Constitution might be an inconvenient thing, but it is the, the basis for all of our law. But let's move beyond that. This is an appropriations bill. This amendment, no matter what the result thereof, is not going to be in this bill, and this bill have the President's signature. So we're dealing with, we're ready, this is the beginning of a whole set of amendments. Having nothing to do with how much money we're going to spend, but having to do with various political passions. Most, if not all of them, are going to be stripped from this bill. So we're going to spend hours here. We're going to debate these things, but they're not going to be part of the bill as it finally becomes the law of the land. We're not going to resolve immigration policy in this bill. So I'm going to recede from uh, using all of this time. I want to thank my colleagues for their comments. But the truth of the matter is, this is actually an appropriations bill, and these matters are going to get settled in some other way. I thank the gentlelady for offering the amendment. It does violate the notion of our Constitution of separations of powers, and I believe that even in a Democratic controlled Congress with a Republican president, I would vote against denying the executive branch the right to have its lawyers go into court and argue whatever point of view they wanted to argue. Thank you, and I yield back 
the remainder of the time. Yield back my time. Gentleman yields back his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentlelady from Tennessee. As many as are in favor will signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed will say no. Opinion the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Mr. Chairman. For the purpose of the gentlelady from Texas tries. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. We ask for a recorded vote on the last amendment. The, the gentleman's request is not timely. Okay. Well, let me thank you for the ruling. Does the gentleman discuss it? Will the gentlelady from Texas. The House will be in order. Will the gentlelady uh, clarify which amendment she is offering? Um, I'm offering uh, Jackson 381 X XML. 381. The clerk, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Ms. Jackson Lee of Texas. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following section. The amounts otherwise provided by this act for the Department of Justice are revised by reducing the amount made available. It's consent that the amendment be considered as read. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. General lady is recognized for five minutes on her amendment. I thank the uh, gentleman. I, I really do thank the chairman and ranking member of this committee. This is a difficult hurdle and a difficult task. But I do believe that this is uh, an amendment can, can draw bipartisan concern. And I say that <clears throat> because all of us have daughters wives and sisters. This amendment deals with the Debbie Smith DNA backlog grant that my colleague from New York sponsored and many of us co-sponsored and saw authorized through the Judiciary Committee. The amendment seeks to restore $34 million to the backlog of rape kit tests that are plaguing the justice system across America. We go back more than a decade, and New York City reported having 17,000 untested rape kits. In 2004, the Department of Justice indicated there was a backlog of hundreds of thousands of untested DNA kits. This is the only way that law enforcement can ensure that the cases are prosecuted and the right person is prosecuted. This is the only way women who have been violated and sexually abused can have their day in court. Has anyone dealt with a victim of rape? Having sat on the board of one of our community women's center, I know the stories that they have told. And even we've seen rape increased among our younger women, teenagers. Even though during the Bush administration and we supported it, there was an influx of dollars to the advancing justice account, we have still seen thousands of backlog cases. For example, in my own city of Houston, it has been acknowledged in San Antonio, Dallas, and Houston that cities across the state of Texas have acknowledged significant backlog of untested rape kits to their police storage facilities at least 4,000 kits in Houston, 16,000 in Dallas and San Antonio. These are only cities in one state. And so, uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe the ability to make the added $34 million just for the simple action of justice to millions of women that are yet unaccounted for, or to be able to move the backlog which, Mr. Chairman, and to my colleagues, has not even been assessed. The reason why our numbers are as low as people might assume they are, and I do not believe 17,000 or 22,000 are low, is because the records of the individual jurisdictions are not kept. And so these dollars would help to access uh, additional resources directly pointed toward the backlog. I know that a lot of work was done, but the grant program under this bill, under the DOJ 
as I indicated, is down 378 million or 17 percent. This simply tries to close the gap on the hurt and the harm that has been done to those who have suffered a violent rape. Remember, justice delayed is justice denied. A rape kit that is now in storage containers around the nation because law enforcement doesn't have the resources at the local level to pierce the backlog means that prosecutors are not able to prosecute the cases and women remain without justice. Women have been brutalized, uh, women who are suffering uh, the devastation of rape, many of whom suffer with the, uh, if you will, uh, the devastation of that act for many, many years. And many of us know that many women ask the question, was it their fault? We move beyond that, but I believe this amendment will at least provide the necessary resources uh, in order to provide um, the overcoming of this terrible backlog. My colleagues, please help us. Please help us render justice and provide for uh, the uh, solving or the piercing of the backlog of date, ki date rape kits, excuse me, rape kits uh, that have not been tested uh, throughout the nation. I yield back. General Lady yields back her time. For what purposes, gentlemen from Virginia rise? I rise in opposition to the amendment. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, we have 125 million. We are at the administration's request. 125 million for DNA, 117 million for the DNA back backlog. Uh, the General Lady's Act. It's a very important program. The Debbie Smith DNA Backlog Grant Program provides grants to states and units of local law enforcement, local governments to connect DNA analysis and backlog. But we're at the administration's request, and what this would do, it would cut from ATF $34 million. Uh, these are DNA, it would require the, the riffing of a number of D, uh, a ATF employees, it would impact on the violent crime impact teams in dozens of cities. The foundation of the violent crime impact team program is the identification and targeting, disruption, arrest, and prosecution of the worst of the worst criminals possible. Uh, it, so we have met the administration's request. We are at $125 million. It is an important program. There will be $117 million for the DNA backlog. And so we've met that request now to go and to devastate the ATF and do what it do. So since we have met the request, I sure I yield, sure. I, I appreciate the work of this committee, it, and it's the committee that attracts the Judiciary Committee um, and have been a supporter of the work of the ATF uh, for many, many years. As I looked at the numbers, the ATF has 1,153,345,000. Their work is important, but we're only asking for 34 million because the backlog, as I indicated, the backlog has really not been assessed. And I appreciate the 125 million. It's my understanding that we're below the mark, but I appreciate that. But the point that I want to make is that there are backlogs that have not been documented across America. It is far exceeding the 125 million. I just simply ask to be allowed to take 34 million out of the 1 billion of ATF certainly support the work that they do, but the backlog has been going on and on and on. Since the Bush administration, we've never been able to solve the backlog on these rate kits. I, I yield back to time. the gentleman. I re reclaim my, but we have fully funded this, and this would require a reduction of ATF salaries and expenses account by a cut of this magnitude would result in the loss of 268 ATF personnel, including 111 agents. More than 4% of ATF's onboard agent staffing. It would require that each ATF remaining staff be furloughed for five days. We're at the amount. It's very important. You have my commitment. We'll fight to make sure that we stay at the amount. I don't know where the Senate is on this. It's very important. But to go above of what the administration asked and to devastate the ATF, I think, would be not a good idea. So I'm committed to the program, but we are at the level and I don't think we should go higher and devastate uh, the ATF and bring about 
the number of rifts and furloughs and reduction, particularly in some of the important roles that ATF does. Well, may, that, may I inquire of the chairman one, one more question, please? Uh, Mr. Wolf, what can we do? We're, we're at what the mark is. Again, I'm looking at different numbers. You're obviously the, the chairman and I see a short change, but the point is is that this is attempting to respond to the rate tips in jurisdictions that have not been accounted well, for. Well, I think we should. I, I, I completely agree with you. And if there's any additional allocation and we can go, we will. But we're at their request, and I don't think that we can now devastate the ATF. But, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And Adam Schiff on the committee, I don't see Mr. Schiff here, he's been a strong advocate of this as 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 a chairman but i uh, this is not a good amendment but th the program's good and we'll continue and if we get a better allocation and things happen you know we'll be very very sympathetic to it but i ask based on the fact that we have met the, the administration's level 117 million for the the dn backlog i don't want to devastate the a atf and i urge a no vote for the i yield to the general would uh would uh withdraw the amendment, we would work with her to make sure that we think we've met the re what is needed to make sure that every one of these kits are analyzed. And um, if that's not the case, then we can revisit it between now and conference. But we'd be, if you, the chairman and I would be glad to work with you to make sure that this is done because, as he said, uh, we agree that this is vitally needed. We think we've met the request as needed. Well, if the gentleman would uh, just yield. Gentleman from so Virginia controls the time. I don't have any time. I was gentleman from oh, Virginia controls the time. Uh, if I may respond, uh, let me um, take. Time, the time the gentleman has expired. I think Ms. Gibson to yield idea. her 15 seconds. Yeah, what purpose the gentleman yeah, from? Uh, Thank you. What purpose the uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? I rise to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Lady. In the spirit of how important this is, and to reinforce the fact that. Uh, there are rate kits that are unaccounted for because there is not any data kept. So I don't think we've met the numbers, but I'm willing to work with the chairman and the ranking member to uh, determine how we can move in our next steps. I do tell you and I do acknowledge uh, that um, we're, doing, uh, we're doing the work, but we don't have enough money to do all the work that we need to bring justice to women across this nation. I withdraw the amendment. I ask unanimous consent to withdraw the amendment is and there to work objection? with the chairman and ranking member. Is there Thank objection? You. Without objection, so ordered. I yield back the remainder of my time. Uh, for what purpose does the gentlelady from Tennessee rise? I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment offered by Mrs. Blackburn of Tennessee. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following. Section, each amount made available by this act, other than an amount required to be made available by a, prov by a provision of law, is hereby reduced by 1%. The gentlelady is rec from Tennessee is recognized for five minutes on her amendment. And I thank you so much for the recognition. And I bring this amendment forward tonight just as I do every single year for these appropriations bills because it is so important that we get the out of control spending here in Washington, D.C. under control. We all know that at this point in time we are borrowing 40 cents of every single dollar that we spend. And as we look at this appropriations bill that is before us, we're talking about another $51.1 billion. So the amendment tonight makes a 1% across the board haircut. It would be $511 million. Now, I know all of the arguments. Since I've been doing these, since I came to Congress, I know all the arguments that I'm going to have. Well, this is a carefully crafted bill. We have worked diligently on this bill. We have sought to get the costs down in these appropriations. And I truly appreciate the diligence that goes into this. But I have to tell you, on behalf of the men and women that I represent, the mom and pop stores in my district, which are primarily run by mom, at this point in time, on behalf of so many of our small farms, our realtors, who were all cutting back more than 1%, more than 10%, many have revenues that are off 25 or 30%, we need to require the bureaucracy to get in behind here and cut another penny. 
It should be done for our children and our grandchildren. Indeed, if you want to look at what is happening to them, the share of the national debt for my two grandsons is $50,000 each. That is the burden that we are placing on them because we will not cut a little further. We will not reduce what the bureaucracy has to spend. We are not making the requirements of them that our companies and businesses and stores are having to make of the work that they do every single day. Now, we all know that across the board spending cuts work. We've seen them work in our state. We saw it work in Tennessee when a Democrat governor went in and cut not 1% but 9% across the board. This is what you do when you want to get your spending under control. It's what we as a body should do to prevent DOJ activism because reining that in and preserving our Constitution is priceless. It is a step that we need to take and do that heavy lift. It is our job to be good stewards of the taxpayers' money. It is our job to make certain that we stop borrowing money and spending money that we don't have for programs that many of our constituents do not want and certainly our children and grandchildren do not want. It is time for us to make additional cuts into this budget, so I offer again the 1% across the board cut. It will make a $511 million reduction to the spending in this appropriation, and with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlelady yields back her time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Virginia rise? I, I rise in opposition to the amendment. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. And I appreciate what the gentlelady said. Frankly, what we should do here is uh, I'll take the amendment tonight and support it. We can reform Social Security. I mean, we gave Jimmy Buffett and Warren Buffett a big break on Social Security with the payroll tax. We literally bankrupt the Social Security system. So if there's an amendment, I'll take the amendment. If you want to take an amendment tonight, I'll take it to close the loophole. 2010, everyone here who paid their taxes paid more taxes than GE. More taxes than GE. They filed 57,000 pages of tax reform. And they were one of the highest taxpayers in China. You got a GE taxpaying amendment, I'll take it tonight. But Every dollar is not the same. Let's cut Eric Holder more than we cut Director Mueller. You know, let's cut some climate issue over and NOAA where nobody knows more than we cut cyber terrorism. Let's cut something else rather than cutting the DA backlog. To take it across the board is just not a good, a good idea. Across the board cuts, and I think the general lady had it right, really does kind of impact on the work that's gone down on the bill. It says one dollar in one agency is as, just as dispensable and the same as any other agency. I agree with her that we got to do everything we, we can. I think I was one of the people here, I support Simpson Bowles. I never signed the Grover Northwest Tax Pledge. I want to do whatever we can to deal with this issue. I want to put everything on the table. But now we're going through the appropriations process now, and to go across the board, FBI and Eric Holder. If I had to make it, I'd take $2 of Eric Holder and give $2 to Director Mueller, but not go across the board. I urge a no vote on the amendment. Yield back to bounce my time. Gentleman yields back his time for what purpose is the gentleman from Washington right? No. I just, uh, I move to strike the record. Gentleman's right, recognized for five minutes. I want to commend Mr. Wolf for what he just said. And uh, I agree with him, and I think it's a violation of our oath of office uh, to do as he has suggested. So I, I hope we can vote this down. I yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. What purpose does the gentleman from New York rise? That's where a gentleman's recognized for five minutes. You know, I, I rise to oppose the amendment and in many ways agree with uh, Chairman Wolf. When you present an across-the-board cut, it always sounds good. And yes, I will say we've worked diligently on this bill, and it's been many months in putting it together. But what's interesting about it is that every time you speak about an across-the-board cut, 
people get excited and they say, boy, that sounds good. But these days, those cuts don't hold the same strength that they used to hold in the past. Because in the past, there were times, and I was part of it, and so were many people on that side, when we felt that we had to grow some accounts. And so one could argue that a 1% or 2% or whatever percent cut uh, taking place made sense. But it's interesting to note now, and I wonder how many people who would present these amendments know, that these budgets, these bills that come before you, have been cut dramatically already. Last year, this year, they've been cut dramatically. The allocations given to the subcommittees to put together these bills, not the allocations of the past. There isn't a single, single bill on the floor, perhaps defense, the only exception, that is really growing the budget. On the contrary, it's a cut and a cut and a cut. So the bigger question is, at what point does it end? At what point do we feel that we don't need, not at this moment, at what point do we feel that we don't need a government, that we don't need a budget? It's, will zero be satisfactory to people who want to cut? Zero, not spend a single penny in the federal government? This bill, as presented by Mr. Fatah, by Chairman Wolf, by the leaders of this committee and this committee, is not a bloated bill. It is a streamlined bill. So it's easy to stand up and say another 1%, another 3%, another 5%, but where does it end? At what point do we say that we have a responsibility to fund a government understanding what people are living through and understanding what we must leave for the American people. But we can't destroy every agency, and that's what these cuts do. I yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. <clears throat> what purpose, the gentleman word. from Pennsylvania, Rice? We have a... Uh, gentleman, move to strike the last word. I move to strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized for five minutes. I just want the, uh, the House to be aware that this would be a cut in the FBI budget of close to $100 million. This will be a cut to the DEA. We just had a major incident which the federal government and our law enforcement agencies are working on right now. There's a mother uh, and three children from Tennessee uh, who uh, there's been murder and kidnapping, trying to track these people down. The idea that cutting a dozen agents doesn't affect our ability to apprehend criminals or to protect the public I think is um, really it would be malfeasance on the House to just pass an across the board cut. If you want to cut an amount of money, let's examine where you want to cut it at. But the, the, it's, it's very easy to come and just say, well, let's slash across the board. It is true that we've held lots of hearings. It is true that we visited with our law enforcement agencies. I've been out to the terrorist training center. I've met with Director Mueller. I mean, this will be a cut that has an impact. So this is not frivolous, and the House Appropriations Committee has the responsibility of figuring out what needs the nation has that need to be funded. It is the Ways and Means Committee under our Constitution that is supposed to figure out how to pay for it. So I don't hear anyone running to the floor asking for an across-the-board tax increase because they see that as being onerous. But to cut FBI agents who are in the pursuit in hot pursuit of criminals, uh, you know, we think that's fine. I think it's wrong. I ask that we oppose this amendment. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentlelady from Tennessee. As many as are in favor will signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed will say no. No. And pinning the chair, the noes have it. Mr. Chairman, ask for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blacksburn, will be postponed. For what purpose does the gentleman from Virginia rise? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that I be permitted to request a recorded vote on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Tennessee, Ms. Black. Is there objection? Without objection, a recorded vote is requested on the amendment offered by Mrs. Black of Tennessee. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the mem offered by the General Aid from Tennessee will be postponed. For what purpose the gentleman from Georgia rise? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. I the think it's uh, numbered 101. The clerk will designate the amendment. 
Amendment offered by Mr. Brown of Georgia at the end of the bill before the short title insert the following section each amount appropriated or otherwise made available by this act other than an amount required to be appropriated or otherwise made available by a provision of law an amount made available under the heading United States Marshals Service an amount made available under the heading Federal Bureau of Investigation or an amount made available under the heading National Aeronautics and Space Administration is hereby reduced by 12.2 percent. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for five minutes on his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I listened very intently to the debate on the last amendment and we have an amend amendment that actually cuts more than just Ms. Blackburn's one percent. Now, listen very carefully to what my dear friend, who I have utmost respect from, for Virginia, what he was saying, and I do have a tremendous respect for him, and I hope with my amendment his blood pressure won't go up. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, this is a very straightforward amendment. It would simply reduce the overall spending for much of the underlying bill by 12.2 percent, sir. It's no secret that we as a nation are facing an economic emergency. Entitlement spending remains out of control. Discretionary spending continues to grow. And should the President's health care plan, God forbid, be upheld by the Supreme Court, we could be facing the largest expansion of federal government spending in recent history and the greatest attack upon our freedom. While the budget passed by the House last month would rein in government spending, it would take decades for it to be balanced. Mr. Chairman, we don't have decades to wait around for this budget, which is far better than the President's request to right our fiscal ship. During the budget debate, 135 members joined me in supporting the Republican Study Committee's budget, substitutes, which prioritized spending in such a way that it would have balanced in just five years. I'm not sure we have five years, Mr. Chairman, but the Republican Study Committee's budget would balance in five years. The RC budget represents a realistic view of the dire situation that we are facing and the tough choices which, we must, was, which must be made to get our nation back on the right track fiscally. However, this view isn't for the faint of heart. The RC budget would have reduced the 302A allocations relative to those seen in the underlying bill by 24.4 percent. My amendment is meant to be a compromise. I'm here to be a compromiser tonight. A halfway point between the level approved by the House passed budget, which is used in the underlying bill, and the level recommended by the RSC, supported by over 100 members of this body. My amendment would also exempt the U.S. Marshal Service. It would exempt the FBI and NASA. It would allow these agencies to continue to further our national security objectives. It is long past time to get serious about our fiscal situation, and my amendment would be a profound step toward getting federal spending under control. I urge support of my amendment, and I yield back. <clears throat> Gentleman yields back his time. What purpose, gentlemen, for Virginia rise? I, I rise in opposition to the amendment. The I'm not going to go into detail. Five uh, it, it would. Uh, this would be great news for the prisoners in prison, because it would cut the prison system by 600 million dollars, and we'd have to let a lot of people out of prisons, or we couldn't operate them. But I commend the gentleman. He's been very consistent throughout the night. I think this would be an impact on DEA probably in a range of 200 million and when we think of the drugs coming into the country. So well, I appreciate the gentleman's compromise spirit of taking it down from 25 percent to, to half. I, I urge a no vote on the amendment. Yield back to balance my time. Gentleman yields back his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? Uh, I, I move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I was trying to figure out if we cut 12 percent uh, of the weather satellites uh, budget would we, how would the satellite uh, actually function with 12% uh, less of its capacity? 
we have in Georgia, which the gentleman is from, and from many of our other states, we've had the most severe uh, weather that the country's ever seen over the last 20 months. We've had more billion dollar plus incidents uh, than we've ever had. And when we have forecasting uh, through our satellite uh, systems that, that we're launching through the Weather Service, we actually save lives and money uh, by being able to delineate exactly where the storms or tornadoes or hurricanes are going to hit. Uh, and it takes time to be able to evacuate people and the like. So his cuts to the National Weather Service under this 12 percent approach, uh, especially with exempting certain agencies, would have a disproportionate effect. Uh, and I think that uh, for farmers and for others, uh, the lack of weather information would be very problematic in our economy and would actually threaten lives. So I would uh, reject this amendment. I thank the gentleman for his offering. I hope the House has the wisdom to also reject it, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Brown. As many as are in favor will signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed will say no. No. Pain of the chair and the noes have it. Gentleman from Mr. Georgia. Chairman, I request the yeas and nays. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Georgia will be postponed. What purpose is General Lady from Texas? I, I move to strike the last word. General is uh, recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I had intended to offer an amendment uh, regarding the Civil Rights Division uh, and recognizing uh, the uh, structure of the amendment. I, I chose to uh, raise a point of concern as I did with the date rape, and uh, I look forward to working uh, with the chairman and the ranking member, particularly on the date rape uh, backlogs that I believe are epidemic across America. But in looking at the uh, appropriations bill, I noticed $40 million, 4% less than requested uh, for uh, certain areas in the Justice Department, which would include the Solicitor General, the Tax Division, criminal division, civil division, but more importantly, the civil rights division. And it is well important to recognize how valuable civil rights are to Americans. No matter what your political perspective, there's always someone raising the point, I don't want my civil rights violated. And so obviously, as I have interacted with the civil rights division, uh, particularly as they are engaging in the results of uh, the discrimination in lending and foreclosures, a large responsibility, uh, particularly looking at the impact of subprime mortgages, uh, as they look at the enormity of voting rights, and we have had a siege of attacks with voting ID laws passed across America, and one would argue there's nothing wrong with voting ID laws, and you're absolutely right. But when they have been determined to impact minorities in a discriminatory fashion, then it is sad when the Civil Rights Division may be limited in funding. In the state of Texas, for example, our state law has been ruled invalid under Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act because it discriminates against Hispanics, African Americans, and even the elderly based upon the requirement of getting a photo ID from the Department of Public Safety. Not to fall to the Department of Public Safety, but those offices are not located in many places where communities of color live, and therefore they are disproportionately impacted in preventing them from having the right to vote. We've gone through many states redistricting, and in some instances those cases have gone uh, before the Department of Justice and the federal court. So civil rights... I am well reminded that it was the Civil Rights Department of both the Kennedy administration and the Johnson administration that came to the aids of civil rights leaders and activists, uh, particularly in the, late, in the 1960s under the Johnson administration. On occasion, they had to be rescued by the Department of Justice. And so I raise great concern when we have to find ourselves in a place where we would cut those funds such that they might impact uh, the rendering of justice. It is well known that we have tough times, but I hope that as we make our way through the Congress that we will find that it is important that we ensure that the funding that 
is rendered to the particular group of lawyers that come to the defense of civil rights of all Americans that we ensure for the full funding of that particular subset of the division under the Department of Justice. And so my intent would be to add this comment to the record, and with that, I yield back. Yields back her time. Who seeks recognition? Who seeks recognition? For purposes, gentlemen from Florida, rise. I'm an amendment at the desk, sir. The clerk designate the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Sutherland of Florida. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following. <clears throat> Section, none of the funds made available by this act may be used to develop, approve, or implement a new limited access privilege program, as that term is used in Section 303A of the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Con Conservation and Management Act that are not already developed, approved, or implemented for any fishery under the jurisdiction of the South Atlantic, Mid-Atlantic, New England, or Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for five minutes on his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> the Sutherland Grimm Amendment prohibits funds for the Appropriations Act from being spent on limited access programs, otherwise known as catch shares. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm referring to here is nothing less than a battle to prevent freedom in our oceans. I want to make sure that I'm very clear that our amendment only addresses the New England coast, no, 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 I'm fine. No. the South Atlantic, the Mid-Atlantic, and the Gulf of Mexico. I also want to make sure that it is clear that this amendment only deals with new annual catch limits, not any old uh, programs that are currently in place. Catch shares are no different than any other inside the Beltway style tactic determined to destroying American freedom. By capping the amount of fish that may be caught annually. Yes. Um, I've been here since the Magnus and Stevens Act was enacted. Catch shares are done by local consuls of fishermen. It doesn't come out of Washington, D.C. Every region of the country has a regional group that they, that they determine what these catch shares should be. This is not a, an implemented program from Washington, D.C. I mean, the, the gentleman at least owes it at five minutes to 11 to give an accurate description of this amendment and this program, which is a program that many people, especially on the West Coast, by the way, think is a good program that's helping us back. protect the fishery. Would the gentleman yield back? And, and I yield back to you, sure. In, in, reclaim my time. In yes. an attempt to answer your question, while you were here since the Magnus and Stevens, my family was continuing 200 years of living on the coast in the Gulf of Mexico. So though I respect your time here, okay, we were there experiencing the crushing impacts of what catch shares do. And by the way, sir, I want to make it very clear. But isn't the local I want to make group it very down clear, there in your area? No, I want to make decision? it very clear. I reclaim my time. I want to make it very clear that this amendment does not affect the West Coast. I don't think you apparently. Oh, I know that. Made reference Would the gentleman to that. yield? First the, gentleman, the East Coast, then the West Coast. Would the gentleman yield to me to help support his amendment? I'm in support of the gentleman's amendment. Would he yield to me? Yeah, they're welcome to get their own time, sir. Uh, gentleman from Chair, Florida so controls. Like gentleman statement. from Florida controls the time. So, look, it, it is very clear, okay, Before that these catch shares in the bodies of water that I made reference to are an effort by a select group, okay, to take away the individual fishing rights of individual citizens, and to implement a cap and trade system where fish are traded like a commodity. The only problem, the American people own this natural resource. This is not like a crop where a farmer has planted this in a field. And so I want to be very clear that uh, uh, this does not affect any existing programs. It just says that no dollars may be used for new, new programs. And I would like, I would ask uh, uh, Mr. Speaker if I could submit uh, for the record uh, this extensive list of organizations and associations that represent tens of thousands of fishermen, commercial, 
votes for hire as well as individuals, and I'd like to submit this for the congressional record. That request has to be made on general leave. Thank you. Thank you, sir, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. What purpose does the gentleman from Massachusetts rise? No, well, let me, let me give ref What purpose does the gentleman from Washington okay. rise? Um, I got a letter. Let me read you just this letter because I think it really picks up the, what, the, what this program is about so the members understand that this is, this is a program that's going to help the fishermen, not hurt them. We're asking to write your continued support for the ground fish trawl program in the FY1213 National Marine Fishery Service budget. Today, a year after the implementation of catch shares in our fishery, things are beginning to improve. We are seeing higher prices for several key ground fish species. We have greater flexibility in when and how we fish. Discards are down dramatically. Gear innovation is on the rise. Fishermen, processors, fish managers, and others are coming together to make this new program work. While the new management system will require ongoing improvement to maximize economic and biological performance, the early trends are positive. And we continue into the second year of the Catch Share program. A fundamental challenge confronts us, observer and program management costs. The high cost of observers, a key element of Catch Share program, is a subject of deep concern to many of us. While other times we, can, we will assume most, more of the cost, we continue to require federal assistance during the transitional phase to help support the cost of observers. So here we have a group of people who think that this is the program of the future. It is decided upon by a regional council under the Magnuson-Stevens Act. Every region can make decisions that affect the fishery in their area. And in our area of the world, this is highly regarded. Um, the gentleman from Alaska isn't on the floor, but he'll t tell you that people up in Alaska on halibut, this has been a great salvation. We're protecting the lives of these people so they don't have to rush out, catch all their fish in one or two days. They can do it, they have a share, and they can do it over a reasonable period of time. It adds safety to this program. But the last thing it is, is coming out of D.C. This isn't NOAA or NIMS. This is the regional council in the gentleman's part of the world, in the northeast, it, on the Atlantic coast, off of Florida. These regional councils, they're the ones that make the decisions. I thought that, I thought that our, other, our good friends on the other side were for authority being used at the local level. And so I, I urge you all, do not uh, buy into this amendment. We should defeat this. And by the way, the gentleman from Washington is the chairman of the Natural Resources Committee. The gentleman, uh, Mr. Sutherland from Florida, is a member of that committee. If he's got a complaint, why don't you go to your own committee and work on it rather than coming here and, and screwing up an appropriations bill uh, where, where we don't need writers, frankly, and we appreciate your concern, but go talk to the chairman and you guys sit down and write some laws if you can get them passed. Back his time. I yield back my time. Uh, for what purpose the gentleman from New York rise? Strike the last word, Chairman. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. I rise in support of my friend and colleague from Florida. I represent an island, and I respect the letter that was just read, but I have to be honest, those that I'm speaking to in my district that have made their living for generations on the water disagree. And I have been contacted by many of my constituents that have great concerns that this will hamper their ability to earn a living. And I want to add, when we talk about the economy and growing the economy and creating jobs, think about those that have a charter boat and they bring out people from all over that come and vacation and go fishing. Think of all the ancillary business that that brings, all of the hotels, all of the restaurants, all of the shopping that they do. I think that is also relative. Uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, yield some time to the gentleman from Massachusetts who's been waiting. I thank the gentleman. I strongly support the amendment. The gentleman from Washington has the regional councils confused with the people who fish. There's a regional split here. If, you, if people on the West Coast are happy with this, good luck to them. 
Here's what happened. In the Magnuson Stevens Act passed in the main dock of 2006, we said that for provisions that would provide for these kind of limitations were to be voted on by the people in the fishery. There would have to be a vote of the people in the fishery. What happened was in Washington, they decided that there were areas where they wouldn't get the fishermen to vote for it. Maybe on the West Coast they would, on the East Coast they wouldn't. So they invented, Washington did, catch shares, which is a way to have exactly the same impact as what we have in the bill, but without a referendum. We went to court, the judge said, well, you got a good argument, but I got to go with the, with the administrator. If this amendment passes, if the people in the fishery, the fishermen, want to vote for something that will in effect be catch shares, they can put it into effect. And if they vote no, it'll be no. The regional councils, they are not only fishermen, there are appointees, NIMS has had a major impact. So let's be very clear. If you think the fishermen ought to be able to decide, that's what the law says. This catch shares is an invention to get around the law. If it, this amendment passes, catch shares will not be around, but the law that we passed in 2006 that allows the fishermen to vote, if they want to implement it, will still be there. People on the West Coast want it, fine. But the amendment re says, reclaiming, you know, reclaiming my no, time. No, excuse me, that is what the amendment says. The amendment says you can't have what they call catch shares. If it passes, you will go back to the underlying Magnuson-Stevens Act, which did come out of committee. What, you know who amended the bill? Not here in the appropriations process. NIMS. If there are no catch shares, that means you can't do this without a vote of the fishermen. You will go back to the underlying statute, Magnuson-Stevens, which will say that if the fishing, if the people in the fishery want to vote for it, they can. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. I thank my friend for yielding. Thank you. And I, in closing, I just want to say that I urge all of my colleagues to join me in supporting our fishermen and support this amendment. I yield back. Neil yields back Speaker. his time. For what purpose the gentlelady from Massachusetts rise? <laughs> our main used to be, I think, a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Don't bring up bitter memories. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I uh, move to strike the last word. General, gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much. I rise in strong opposition to this amendment, Mr. Uh, Grimm said that he uh, represents an island. I live on an island, and I live in the heart of the fisheries in the state of Maine. And I uh, join my colleagues in Maine in supporting this, and I'm sorry to see my good friend from Massachusetts is in opposition, but it shows that there are differences in the fisheries. And I guarantee you that the fishermen in my state would say this is not to circumvent the law. This is a law that is now working in our state and highly successful. This amendment would block the use of catch shares for managing our nation's fisheries by superseding the Regional Fisheries Management Council process set up by Congress. I live in the heart of the district where people have lost a tremendous amount of fish and are looking for ways to make sure that they have a fisheries industry to pass along to their children and their grandchildren. The sector's management system in Maine has done that. It has allowed innovative fishermen, like members of the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association, to manage their small businesses in a way that works best for them in their own way of managing it. By having no allocation and the flexibility to fish on their own schedule, which I can tell you is far safer and far more profitable, fishermen can enter into contracts with processors and avoid the race to fish, improving their bottom line and their safety. And it's been proven over and over again. Some Maine fishermen have even developed community-supported fisheries co-ops, which bring local fish to the tables of local consumers, strengthen our communities while getting fishermen a better price for their catch. It is critical for coastal communities and working waterfronts that fishermen are allowed to utilize the best management tools for their particular fisheries. Catch shares may not be the best option for every fishery, but that decision should be left to the industry, the management experts, and the scientists in their region where the fishery occurs. In order to help our fishermen, we should be focused on improving the stock assessments, implementing cooperative research programs, addressing monitoring changes, and ensuring fair enforcement. This amendment would do none of these things. Instead, it would take a critical management tool out of the toolbox to keep our fishermen out of the water. I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting fishermen by keeping all options usable for wise fisheries management in opposing this amendment and sticking with the fishermen in the state of Maine who have found this highly successful, far more safe for the industry, and much more profitable for them. Any other argument is just plain wrong. Would the gentlelady yield? Glad to. Uh, I have a letter here from the Atlantic Trawlers Fishing, Inc., the Associated Fisheries of Maine, and a whole bunch of other groups, and they say, 
Dear Congress, please don't micromanage our fisheries from Washington, D.C. We represent thousands of hardworking fishing men and women from all over the country who want local fishermen to write the rules governing their fisheries instead of having Congress dictate them through an appropriations writer. <laughs> through, the, through the nation's primary fishing law, the Magnuson-Stevens Act, Congress has given regional fishery management councils made up of fishing industry representatives and others the power to write the rules governing fishing in their area. But in a move that would tie the hands of local fishermen, Representative Steve Sutherland recently sent a letter to the appropriator seeking a writer to the Commerce Justice Science Appropriation Bill that would prohibit the future development and implementation of new catch share programs for any fishery under the jurisdiction of the fishery management consuls in certain regions. Such a writer would prevent consuls from eliminating command and control regulations that burden our small businesses, imperil our jobs, drive up our fuel costs, even put our lives at greater risk. Shame on you. And others don't successfully conserve, I, that was an edit, by the way, <laughs> and others don't successfully conserve fish populations. Although catch shares have proven successful in commercial fisheries around the world and in the United States, today fully half the fish caught in U.S. fish waters, federal waters are under catch share management. They may not be right for every fishery, but that is a determination best made by the consuls which have local representation, not legislators in Washington, D.C. Congress micromanaging federal fisheries through appropriation writers is big government at its worst. Reclaiming my time, not General, interested in yielding. General, uh, General Lady still controls the time. Thank you. How much time do I have left? General Lady has 30 seconds remaining. So just to be clear, the Catch Shares program, as you've heard over and over again, suits the fishermen of my district. It serves them well. It brings about a tremendous amount more safety. When they had allocations, they had to go out whenever the day was, whatever the weather is, with Catch Shares. They can make that determination on their own. They can get a better price for their uh, fish. Uh, if the Port Clyde fishermen were up this late, which I feel confident they're not, and they saw Congress debating the opportunity to take away this right that has been very successful for them, they would be shocked and angry and frustrated and down here tomorrow with their boats. Time and of the General Lady has expired. What purpose does the gentleman from South Carolina rise? Move to strike last word. General Lady, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield my time to the gentleman from Florida. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. You know, what, what's amazing is I always hear stuff that's not true. You know, I was very clear. I was, I was, I was very clear. The letter that my colleague, Mr. Speaker, read clearly stated that it would eliminate <coughs> programs, catch share programs, currently uh, in, in, in bodies of water all around America. And that's just not true. That's not what it says. My amendment is crystal clear. New catch shares. In New England, Mid-Atlantic, South Atlantic, and Gulf of Mexico. That's four bodies of water. Okay? Now, I also want to make it very clear that every time that, that opponents or proponents of catch shares stand up, they want to talk about commercial fishermen. And, by, and, I, and I have commercial fishermen in my district, and I'm concerned about our commercial fishing industry. But I'm also concerned about the individual freedoms and liberties of the American people. And the proponents of the catch share program never want to talk about the individual rights and freedoms of the American people. This is a public resource, a natural resource. This is not just for a small select group of commercial fishermen that are backed by very, very wealthy environmentalists to decide alone. This is an issue that is worthy for the American people to speak on. And this is the people's house. And so I stand here Yes, as a member of the people's house, but I also stand here as someone who's lived on the Gulf of Mexico for, as a family for over 200 years. I know what I'm talking about. And you just quoted something that was untrue, Mr. Speaker, and I have a problem with that. Jeez. Yes. This was from an East Coast group of Atlantic fishermen. This wasn't West Coast people. Sir. I quoted, and I gave the title of the people who were I'll reclaim my time, sir. I can you, give you. You mentioned, you mentioned when, you, when, when the gentleman stood up, he mentioned the Pacific. South the, the gentleman Pacific. from South Carolina controls the time. 
I yield the time to the gentleman from Florida. And I'd like to yield. I yield the gentleman. Oh, wait, 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 he's got to yield. I reclaim I my time. Yield it. I can't. The gentleman I'm from sorry. The gentleman from Washington is turning this on its head, and standing on your head is dangerous in any circumstances. But in the water, it's bad for your breathing. What we have in the law are individual transferable quotas. It was written into Magnuson Stevenson, Stevens, and it does exactly what cat shares are supposed to do, with one difference. The gentleman says Washington's micromanaging. No, it was the National Marine Fishery Service that twisted the law. The law says they can do this for new ones. The gentleman is right. It doesn't disrupt anything. It allows them to do it subject to a vote of the people in the fishery. And I would say to my friend from Maine, that may be what they think in Maine, I represent the fishing port in the United States that brings in the most money. And the people there want to be able to vote for themselves. They do not, as does the gentleman from Washington, identify the regional councils as the voice of the fishermen. They have a lot of complaints about that, including the NIMS intervention. So this is the question. It is not whether or not we should have the system that the gentlewoman from Maine mentioned, whether or not you should be able to allocate and come together. There's one point at issue here. Should the fishermen themselves have to vote for it? In the Magnuson Stevens Act, it said you could do any of that new if the fishermen voted for it. The NIMS didn't like the notion of a fisherman vote so they came up with cat shares and said the fishermen don't have to vote. So all of the benefits the gentleman from Maine claims, everything else, it can be done. The difference is the gentleman from Washington apparently thinks the councils are fishermen. The councils do not, in my experience of 20 years of representing a large fishing port, represent the fishermen. The fishermen represent the fishermen. And so the question is not whether or not we allow this kind of allocation in shares, but should it be subject to a vote of the fishermen, as the Madison Stevens Act said, or should this wiggle room that, that, that NIMS came up with allow it to go to the council with NIMS people and others sitting on it and state officials sitting on it as opposed to the fishermen. So the gentleman's amendment is very clear. It will allow those kind of allocations. It would allow any of those things. It allows everything that you get in cat shares, except it calls them individual transferable quotas as it did in the law, not cat shares, and it's subject to a vote of the people in the fisheries. That's the sole issue here in this amendment. Should the people who are the fishermen themselves be able to vote on this, or should NIMS be able to tell the council and the council should be able to do it? I thank the gentleman. Reclaim my time. I appreciate the gentleman from Massachusetts lending his voice to this uh, debate in favor of it, and I'll uh, yield back to the gentleman from Florida.